Stanford University. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Abbasi program forum. We're trying to pause for a moment because some of us have discovered on the way here that there's not a lot of parking. This is, this is quite unusual at Stanford, but tonight <laughs> there's not a lot of parking. My name is Bob Gregg. I'm the director of the Abbasi program. And before we get underway, I want to extend thanks to my colleagues, Azim Nanji and Berchek Keskin Kozat for their planning efforts for this event. And also, uh, Special thanks to Rebecca Quijas and Tatiana Dale Girakur, who is photographing me at this moment, uh, for their assistance with uh, tonight's program. I also want to uh, introduce the moderator of tonight's discussion and then have her um, introduce our other special guests for tonight. Julia Clancy Smith is a professor of history at the University of Arizona, whose and she is a person whose publications and active role in her field are widely admired. Her resume is large and rich, so I'm going to suggest in shorthand the career that she has made and continues. Universities that have enjoyed and benefited from her presence, the University of Virginia and the University of Arizona, where she has taught since 1994, at both of these places, she has regularly won awards for excellence in teaching. Among the courses she offers, Muslim Societies, Medieval and Modern, Struggle and Survival in the Modern Middle East and North Africa, Women, and gen women Gender and Imperialism in the British, French and Dutch Empires from 1800 to the present, a book which has received numerous Prizes, Rebel and Saint, Muslim Notables, Populist Protest, Colonial Encounters, Algeria and Tunisia, 1800 to 1904. She has many book chapters and many articles. I'm being really selective here. A book chapter, Exemplary Women and Sacred Journeys, Women and Gender in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, from late antiquity to the eve of modernity. Another book chapter, Religious Missions, Secular Missionaries, and Muslim Girls' Education in Tunisia, 1840 to 1914. She also has generated, I am uh, wild with envy and uh, incomprehension, she has won an award for a website <laughs> called <laughs> Document-Based History of Women in Modern North Africa. It is a privilege to welcome Julia Clancy Smith and to invite her to begin our forum this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that overly generous um, introduction. Well, it's my great privilege and pleasure to be part of this event this evening. And I will also be uh, presenting very brief and wholly inadequate summaries of our speakers' many, many accomplishments. Were I to give you even a small hint of what they have both done in many, many realms, um, we'd be here till next week. And uh, so I will, I'll do short introductions. But before I do the, the introduction, uh, I'd like to share with you how we um, envision this evening's um, seminar. Um, it seems to us that biography has a certain alchemy, and so personal narratives and life stories reveal hidden social structures and modalities of power. So tonight, we'll begin our, our conversation with a, a journey uh, inspired by the life narratives of our two speakers. And then from those life stories, um, those the stories will open up into wider and exceedingly complex issues of compelling interest to all of us. So our first speaker is the Baroness Kishwar Faulkner, who is the first Muslim liberal Democrat peer in the House of Lords. She's served on the Joint Committee on Human Rights, the European Union Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defense and International Development, and the Joint Committee on the Legal Services Bill. 
She was appointed chancellor of the University of Northampton in 2008 and serves as a board member on uh, many, many nonprofit organizations. And she's also published widely. And I do encourage you to read her works. Our second speaker, Dr. Shahida Jafri, is the founder and vice chancellor of Sadar Bahadur Khan Women's University, the first women's university in Balochistan and the third in Pakistan. She also serves as a, as a director for Pakistan's Rural Support Programs Network and Balochistan Rural Support Program. She was awarded the Accolade of Excellence in 2003 and the President's Award for Education in 2008 for her work in Balochistan. And I understand that she will be graduating their fourth class from the university that she founded this June. Yes. <laughs> Good. So um, I think that Kishwar is going to begin telling us, sharing her life experiences as um, <coughs> an elected member of parliament. Well, Julia, this is, of course, very dangerous territory. Uh, <laughs> because once you get a politician to start right. talking about themselves, you may well be here for, for a week or so. So I, I won't test you, your, your patience in that regard. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. And can I say how delighted I am to be here? Although it's been slightly Siberian, and that's not what I expected, having, <laughs> having come from London. Um, but it's, it's great to be here. And I particularly wanted to thank Professor Rob Gregg and Professor Richard Saller. And above all, my, my friend, whose loss we feel in London very significantly, uh, the director of the Abbasi program, Professor Azim Nanji. Uh, it is our loss in London at the Ismaili Center that he has come here to Stanford, and, and we miss him. So it's good to reconnect. Now, um, today's topic, well, it's called uh, Charting Change, Challenging Power. I have to say that if this was, uh, topic was addressed to, to men, Muslim men perhaps, Asian men also, it may well be called charting power challenging change. Mm -hmm. um, but, but here we are, we, the women will have to try and, and do what we're supposed to do, which is to, to talk about how we have to, there is no choice for some of us, uh, to, ch to move on and um, challenge power. My personal background, um, very briefly, because I think it'll be more interesting to draw broader lessons than to speak about myself. But my personal background, I was born in, in fact, Quetta, where uh, Professor Jaffrey's university is based in Pakistan. I um, grew up within Pakistan and then moved to the Middle East, where I lived in several countries, uh, and eventually fetched up in Europe. The classic, my story is that of a classic em uh, economic migrant. I worked for a good company that had interesting places where you could go and work, London, New York, Paris. So it, it was a pull, and that's how I fetched up in the United Kingdom. I got there in 1976, um, which was remarkable in the United Kingdom because it was the hottest summer on record. And you know, by the way, English people are obsessed by talking about weather, <laughs> so, so you'll get a bit of this. But it was the hottest summer on record. On record. I was young. Um, you know, England was winning in cricket. It doesn't usually excel in sport, and cricket is an esoteric sport. But it was winning. The flowers were out. It was glorious. Wimbledon was fun. And I thought, this is good. Who'd want to leave this? And so some, I don't know, Long time later, 20 something years later, um, I, I'm, I'm still 30 nearly years later, I'm still there. Um, my entry into politics, I think, <clears throat> was completely unforeseen. I, uh, like most economic migrants, I didn't think much about the domestic political scene, um, and uh, I, I didn't really become involved at all. I wasn't a student, and I think most people's activism starts. Their, their political conscious, conscience starts when they're students. Didn't happen to me. And it was really rather fortuitous. I mean, I met some, believe it or not, typically, I should say I'm a liberal Democrat, which is Britain's third party. It's the liberal progressive party in the United Kingdom. And uh, I met someone at a party who told me a little bit about the party. And I had other friends who were conservative and labor. And I thought this bunch were rather fun. 
And so, uh, and I was looking for something else to do with my time. And this person suggested I come and work in Parliament as a you know, young researcher. And that was it, 1986. I was hooked. Um, so I, I did that. And I then subsequently became a director for the Liberal Democrats, my, my party, uh, director for foreign affairs and eventually director of policy. In the meantime, I also went to university. I went to the London School of Economics and the University of Kent. And uh, there came a stage in the late 1990s where uh, you know, there's this maxim, to, in order to get on, you've got to get out. And I think actually in politics, it's about leaving your comfort zone and um, testing whether you really want something. I think in politics, that's terribly important. And it's important for three reasons. Because getting out, moving away from being at the heart of politics, which is once you're working for a political party, you're really there. You're writing the manifestos. You're developing the policies. It's important because it makes you reflect. The distance makes you reflect on your, your creed, your ideology. You know, what you've kind of, you're part of a tribe. Is this the tribe that you needed to be in? Um, it, and it's also getting the distance, becoming <clears throat> what, what the media is constantly telling us we're not, which is living in the real world, if supposedly <clears throat> not working in politics and working elsewhere is supposed to be the real world. Frankly, if I'm a banker, the, you know, as a politician, I look at bankers these days, and I think we're the ones who've lived in the real world, not them. But it, it helps to bring a different perspective. And I think politics absolutely calls for a, a certain kind of animal. There is something quite unique about, there's an element of ruthlessness. There's a huge, there's got to be, it calls for an enormous certainty of vision. You've got to be really clear, doubt. Nobody likes self-doubting politicians. Um, and it's got, you've got to have an ability for massive amounts of personal sacrifice. You can't be a successful politician unless you do it 24 hours a day, which means that a lot of other important things like families, friends, uh, other things go by the wayside. And so I, for me, the getting out was actually quite pivotal. And it took till I got out for several years, and it took till 2001 when I decided that actually, now that I was out and I had decided I still wanted to do this, that I would then contest, I would stand for election. So I did stand for election a couple of times, and I was unsuccessful, which is the fate of most liberals, by the way. Um, but you know, you've just got to keep the faith. You can't give that up. Um, and, and then I was invited to come in to, to the House of Lords. And Julia, if I could just correct one little but significant point of fact, I'm, I would love to be an elected politician, but I'm not. Because <laughs> in the House of Lords, we're appointed, and we're appointed for life. Uh, but there's, the downside is, of course, you have no mandate. And therefore, quite rightly, we are the second chamber in the United We're a revising chamber. We're not the principal chamber in the United Kingdom. The upside is that knowing that you're appointed for life gives you a certain independence of thought that your party whips cannot take away from you. There is no sanction they can really bring to bear other than glowering glances across the room. Uh, because if you really believe that stem cell research or the war in Iraq or the counterterrorism bill is wrong, then there is nothing the party can do to make you do otherwise because they cannot take away your seat. Uh, so it makes the House of Lords a really unique forum to be in, in terms of policy, in terms of legislation. But I wanted to broaden out a little bit in the next few minutes from the personal to give you a picture of minorities in Britain and then to speak particularly about Muslims, because that's my, my own background. Um, the UK Parliament has two chambers, the House of Commons and the Lords. And it's very interesting, because both have seen very significant change in the last 15 years or so. Um, in the, com the Commons was really the bastion of pale, male, and stale, till very recently. <laughs> and it now has 10 minority members from 640, 45. Um, and it has four Muslim members of parliament elected to the House of Commons. And in the Lords, where people are appointed, and therefore political parties can inject people in who wouldn't normally get elected, 
because minorities do have a tougher time getting elected. There are about 25 of us minorities, of which um, 10 are Muslim, which is actually disproportionate to our, to our makeup within the minority populations of the United Kingdom. And there are four who are women. There isn't a single Muslim woman. In fact, there isn't a single Asian woman in the, house, in the House of Commons. But there are four of us in the House of Lords. So as far as elevating minorities or pushing them forward, the House of Lords is actually the appointed chamber has done better than the elected chamber. And the population as a whole in the United Kingdom, just to put that into some context, has nearly 10% of ethnic minorities uh, in the UK. So it's still, the numbers still are way below what they would be if you had elected chambers under proportional systems of representation whereby uh, the, the numbers elected roughly reflect the population, then you would have had about 60 uh, people in the House of Commons and about 70 in, in the House of Lords, and we're a long way from that. But they are nevertheless some of the best figures for Europe. And of course, in this sense, the United States is very interesting because you minorities here have done well, particularly in Congress. I mean, the African-American caucus is, is significant, um, nearly a quarter, uh, 25%. It hasn't done very well by Muslims. You have one Muslim, Keith Ellison, uh, the congressman from Minnesota, I think it is, and that's it. And I, I raise that because some of you might think, why does visible representation matter? And I would argue that it matters for a couple of reasons. But one of the reasons is that it gives minorities a buy-in to the system. And particularly where minorities are recent arrivals, that buy-in becomes very important as an integrating factor. And if you take, I mean, that to me, the most telling example of this was those television pictures after 9-11, where George Bush, having perhaps made some remarks that were characteristic but unwelcome uh, in the outside of the US uh, about uh, crusades and stuff like that, uh, was determined to show that actually he didn't mean anything against Islam per se. So what did he do? He had to look around for someone to stand alongside in the White House. And he got Sheikh Hamza Yusuf from Zaytuna Institute up the road here as the only kind of national Muslim figure who might be known and recognized by Muslims in the United States. In the United Kingdom, after our bombings in 7-7, as we call it, um, in 2005, uh, Blair was the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Blair was able to call on nine parliamentarians to spearhead a task force on Muslim extremism. And the difference in the picture of a gaggle of us, I mean, there were nine parliamentarians, there were lots of community leaders, a lot of Muslims have made it in the media, in other vocations, very visibly so. And, he, you know, so the 25 or 30 people who walked in the doors of 10 Downing Street looked very different from one, you know, charismatic nevertheless, but just one individual here in the White House. And so in that sense, I think visible representation really resonates at times of stress. It, it takes away some of the tensions that are too easily, that come, in, come into effect too easily. And of course, in terms of a parliamentarian, perhaps I would say this, wouldn't I? But in my five years in the House of Lords, I've seen a real change to the formation of public policy by people like me and my other colleagues having, having voice. We've had some pretty unpleasant, I might even, if I were going for hyperbole, call them uh, draconian bills coming through Parliament in terms of counterterrorism. I think Britain in many ways has gone beyond the United States in terms of its counterterrorism legislation because of the shock of uh, having homegrown terrorists, um, uh, second generation Muslims. And when we've had these very difficult pieces of of law that were about to be formed, the fact that a few of us, perhaps just a handful, but nevertheless, a few of us could stand up and say in very clear terms how we weren't prepared to accept this on behalf of our community was on the one hand heartening to the community because they knew there were people who were standing up for them, but also empowered others who weren't from the community but who felt who were from the progressive and liberal stream 
to come on board because we were able to say things that they perhaps wouldn't have been able to say with an authentic voice. So in that sense, I think it's, it's quite important to have visible representation. But I've got a, a few minutes more, so I want to turn to the challenges of being a, a minority politician and being a woman politician and, uh, well, an ethnic minority, a religious minority, and being a woman. Um, you know, it isn't an accident that there are only, that of the 10 or so ethnic minority members in the House of Commons, the elected chamber, only two are women, and that there are only four of us in the House of Lords. I think the gender gap is most evident in this area. As I said, you have astonishingly talented women in the media, in science, in the universities, in the professions. And the gap is really evident in politics across the board, whether you're a white woman or whether you're a minority woman, it's there. So political parties find it very difficult, clearly, to promote women per se, to give women good seats and to get them elected per se. But I think there is something about minority cultures we, we, something about them that keeps women down even more. Um, it's not an accident that you get the men coming through, but somehow they don't see, and you find those women in other professions, so why not in politics? And I think with Muslims, it is, in the UK, it is particularly bad. I mean, the idea that we have nearly 15 between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and there isn't a single Muslim woman in the Commons is astonishing. I, I, I have to say that I'm delighted to report to you, even in advance of our next elections next year, that there will probably be two Muslim women elected because the Labour Party has given them seats where it would take quite a cataclysm for them not to be elected, so they've got good seats. But the other thing I think is a challenge, is the, if you're from a minority, is the ghettoization of women in electoral politics. So there is this sort of slightly patronising attitude when you're a candidate and you're trying to look for a good seat and you go in to see the main political parties, sort of departments that divvy up good seats. There is a kind of, well, in my case, why don't you go to Birmingham or Bradford, in other words, where there are lots of Asians and there are lots of Muslims. Um, you know, I, there is this idea that in order to be elected, you need to, you need to appeal to the electorate, but of course, we think you're great, but the electorate isn't going to think you're great. So stick to who you know, stick to your own group. And I find that deeply patronizing, and I think we'll only mainstream minorities in politics when we get rid of that, that, that kind of thinking. Because ultimately, everybody's social problems are the same. There might be, you know, there might be degrees of deprivation. There may be degrees of unemployment. There may be degrees of better hospital care or worse hospital care or better schools and not, not better schools. But the idea that you must, you know, take me to your leader kind of colonial thinking, you must just, just represent the people that look like you is, is incredibly powerful. And, and all the political parties still do that to some extent. And I find it patronizing also because it tends to lump us in a sort of idea that the electorate are dumb. So here as a Muslim, if I went up to Bradford, if, if that's where I was going to get elected, which is predominantly very high Pakistani origin Muslim community, actually, as I'm sure Professor Jafri will confirm uh, as, as somebody from Pakistan, uh, I wouldn't resonate with lots of those people. They come from a different part of Pakistan. They come from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds even religious and cultural backgrounds to me, who comes from the urban south, there would be nothing that I could bring to the table there that a good, talented white male couldn't bring to the table, and they would definitely prefer the white male to me, as long as he spoke the con con socially conservative speak that they would want. So, so I, I never considered it, which is why I kept trying in dead loss seats over and over again. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a challenge. Um, then you're expected, then the other thing, finally, I would say, is that there is, there is the ultimate challenge. It's a challenge you live with all your life in politics, and I'm sure you live with it in other areas of your minority as well, is that there is always a lingering doubt about whether you've got to where you've got because of your race, because of your gender, because of your ethnicity. 
uh, or whether <coughs> it was really merit or not. And what that does is that it makes you, the need for you to work harder than ever remain through your life. You know, you can never rest on your laurels because there's always that kind of lingering doubt about, oh, well, that's how she got there. And so what it does is, I think, I speak for all of us in those positions, that I think it really makes us work terribly hard. But it is a form of stress. There is no doubt about that. Um, so I think on that, I'll leave it at that and perhaps flesh out some of these themes as we, as we talk further. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Shahida, mm -hmm. we're all anxious to hear from you. Okay. Hmm. Uh, I'm honored to be here today at Stanford. I've flown in from Quetta in Pakistan. Just came in uh, a few days ago. Charting change, challenging power. So I'll uh, share with you a story, my story, how it has happened in my life in Pakistan. So I'm and we'll discuss that later. Three weeks ago, I was presented with a presidential award for public service for establishing a university for women at Quetta, which is providing higher education and empowering women of Balochistan and Pakistan. CNN recently reported and declared Quetta City the most dangerous city in the world. A grenade was tossed into the house of my registrar uh, and who is the acting vice chancellor at Quetta just before I came here. Despite the grenade attack, all the 3,000 students, faculty, staff were present at the university the next day. For the past 30 years, after the Rus Russian invasion of Afghanistan and US war on terror, millions of Afghan refugees have crossed the border into Pakistan and settled in the provinces of Balochistan and Frontier. Thousands of bombs, rockets, missiles have been fired in Quetta City over the past few years and hundreds of innocent men, women and children have lost their lives. Target killings are frequent. So this is the background of the region where I have been working for the empowerment of the disadvantaged people for the past 20 years and educating women and girls. I live within the university campus compound at Quetta and have just flown in, just as I mentioned, came two, three days ago. Let me share with you my experiences of the creation of an institution of higher learning in Quetta city in Balochistan. The Sardar Bahadur Khan Women's University, that's the name of the uh, educational institution, SBK Women uh, University, was the brainchild of a visionary Governor Balochistan, also the Chancellor, Mr. Owais Ahmed Ghani. He is uh, the governor of the frontier now. The government provided an old dilapidated sanatorium specifically designed for a hospital spread over 40 acres of land uh, in Quetta City and uh, they provide us, uh, provided us with uh, generous funding. At an official uh, ceremony handing over the building for the Women's University. This was on 18th of March, 2004. The provincial education minister belonging to an Islamist political party, the MMA, said in his speech that that MMA's manifesto demanded a separate institution of higher learning for women in Balochistan. As after completing their college education, women stayed home due to conservative nature of the society they did not attend co-educational universities as all universities in Pakistan providing higher education are co-educational. So it was the, the Molana who wanted the establishment of the uni women's university. Over the past 11 years, the government has established universities for women, which now total four, and all the women who wished to continue their higher education and were not able to early on thronged the institutions. The Sardar Bahadur Khan Women's University was incorporated on March 10, 2004, and I was appointed its first vice chancellor the next day. 
Classes began in a record period of 59 days, offering Masters of Arts and Sciences in nine disciplines. The pioneering class consisted of 130 students and 22 young women were recruited as faculty on merit from Quetta itself, from Balochistan. <coughs> Senior faculty was hired on visiting basis from the Co-Educational University of Balochistan. It's really hard to find very highly qualified uh, faculty in, in Quetta. Uh, people from the rest of the country also are afraid to come and work there because of the law and order situation. The uncared for hospital structure and the barren uh, land were transformed into a beautiful garden campus. The students at the, at the Women's University come from diverse demographic groups, both ethnic and sectarian. Today, five years later, the university has 2,500 students, married as well as unmarried, young as well as older women. 150 students reside on campus in the hostels coming from all parts of Pakistan and the rest of uh, uh, from Balochistan also from Afghanistan. 700 of them have already received their Masters of Arts and Sciences degrees. Three convocations have been held and the fourth one will be organized soon. PhD classes are planned. 20 faculty members are pursuing their PhDs and several of the alumni have proceeded ab abroad for higher studies. Numerous have taken up professional professions in the education sector and several are married who will raise educated and enlightened children, bringing about a silent social revolution in Balochistan and Pakistan. The university has fully equipped very modern laboratories and well-stocked libraries. Car driving lessons are provided under the umbrella of the university and 50 students and faculty now possess driver's licenses and some have purchased their own cars and are independent and mobile. Students are attached to different organizations for internships and are required to conduct research and write their thesis. Research papers are published in educational and scientific journals. Entrepreneurship and skill enhancement programs are also offered. There's a gem cutting institute and a finishing school. Uh, <clears throat> students are involved in extracurricular activities and they have won numerous awards in debates and sports contests. They organize fashion shows, poetry recitals, uh, cultural events, photography, painting exhibitions. We have offer fine arts also. A daycare facility for the babies of the married students, faculty, and female staff is provided. And the preschool too has been established as the little ones, little babies are now five years old. <laughs> Over 100 regular faculty members provide quality education to students today. The university follows the semester interactive teaching methodology where qualified females are not available. Senior male faculty come to teach. Van and land facility and access to digital library is available and video conferencing will soon begin. Since the Women's University is the highlight of Balochistan, a stream of visitors come to see the soft face of the province. <laughs> Students receive modern education at the same time, staying within and respecting the social and Islamic traditions of the society. History has been created in a backward province. Here I will share with you the stories of two students, students who graduated from the uh, Women's University. I can tell you stories of all the students, every, each and every girl and every faculty have a great story to tell. Uh, these are stories of courage, commitment, dedication, and a quest for knowledge to improve themselves as well as their families and society. Salma is a Pashtun young woman. Pashtuns, I wonder whether you're familiar. They're the Pashtuns are in Afghanistan. They're the Pashto speaking. So she comes from Lorelei. Uh, about three hours drive, we measure the, my, the driving time uh, by road uh, from Quetta. Uh, in the Pashtun belt. Salma's father is a bulldozer driver working for the government agriculture department. When the university opened its doors, her father came and picked up an admission form and enrolled her in the English literature department. She lived in the hostel on campus. After two years, she received her master's degree and was recruited by the university as 
the director of the hostel, because she lived there, we wanted a hostel in charge. Huh? She's provided free accommodation and looks after the affairs of the 150 hostel residents. Huh? Today, she has a permanent, very respectable government job and financially supports herself. Her older brother, who is a medical, uh, who's in medical school, as well as her younger brother, who plans to go to medical school. The father does not pay for any of them anymore. She has taken off the family's financial burden. Shazia is a uh, Hazara girl of Mongolian descent, having come from Afghanistan as a refugee years ago. But she's a Pakistani now. She did a MA in social work and was recruited by the Women's University as a lecturer on merit again. Her father worked as a manual laborer, earning less than $3 a day when he found work. She and her sister paid the, her tuition fee for her studies at the university. Since the fees and everything is subsidized by the government, the tuitions are very low. It's a $100 for the entire two-year master's program. She taught English to others to supplement her income. Even, even this $100 was hard for her family to pay. She, uh, today, she is able to support her family and her father, who is sick, does not work anymore. She is preparing for her GRE and will hopefully win a scholarship in a Western university for a master's or a P and a PhD. Now about me. I was born and raised in Lahore and attended a convent school for girls, the convent of Jesus and Mary. I was married young and have three, three children. <laughs> my uh, husband belonged to the civil service of Pakistan. I continued my education after marriage. My husband supported that. He encouraged me and I continued to study. He was posted as an administrator in different parts of Pakistan. In 1973, he was posted as a diplomat at the Pakistani embassy in Brussels, Belgium, that gave us the family opportunity to travel all over Europe. In 1975, he joined the Asian Development Bank as a foreign government official, diplomat, and we lived in Manila for 14 years and traveled all over Asia and several other countries. We would go back home for short holidays every year. Being with the ADB provided us with a great opportunity of living as a family with 48 different nationalities. <clears throat> Besides being a mother and a homemaker, I worked very hard and earned a PhD from the University of the Philippines in education, teaching of English as a second language. I taught English at La Salle University in Manila for several years. My husband suffered a massive heart attack in 1978 in Manila, which left him suffering from heart failure. After working with ADB for 14 years, he decided to return to Pakistan in 1989 to work with the government. He passed away seven days after landing in Islamabad. We returned to Pakistan after living abroad for 18 years. For me, coming back to Pakistan after so long was like moving into a foreign country. All the children were in the US and I was alone. Life in Europe and the Philippines was very comfortable, but on return to Pakistan, I decided to move into the Karakoram Mountains to live in Gilgit and work with the not-for-profit rural development program, the Aga Khan Rural Support Program. AKRSP worked on improving the quality of life of the disadvantaged rural communities of Gilgit, Baltistan, and Chitral in the Karakoram Mountain regions, huh? bordering China. Uh, through social mobilization and community organization and working at the grassroots. Gilgit had no electricity, running water, heating, TV, and very poor telephone connection. I, I joined in 1990. It was very remote and under, undeveloped, and when the rains and snows came, avalanches and landslides came along, blocking the only link with the rest of the country, the Karakoram Highway, Sometimes the Karakoram parts of the Karakoram Highway were just washed into the Indus mm -hmm. River and the road did, did not exist. Fresh food that came from, as people would call it, down country, which was the rest of Pakistan, uh, would not be available. So food and everything was transported from Pakistan up to the northern areas. 
we had to survive on stocked dry foods. The local population was very tightly knit and existed in closed communities based on different sects. Since 1988, Gilgit saw sectarian violence, which led to imposition of weeks of curfew, disrupting normal life. Every day was an adventure, either related to weather or to the local law and order situation. My boss and mentor was a former civil service officer, Mr. Shwab Sultan Khan, who is a world-renowned and decorated social reformer. We worked and traveled all over the mountain regions on jeeps, and where roads did not exist, flew on our AKF helicopters. My duties existed providing training and non-formal education in the HRD section to the local communities as well as to foreign and government personnel who came to learn from the rural development model created at the AKRSP. The development model was later replicated all over Pakistan, the SARC countries, Central Asian republics, and other countries of the world. I personally supported and established numerous home and community-based schools in that region. A very large educational institution, a high school was established in Alti Thunza that graduated hundreds of local girls and boys during the past 18 years. Living alone and working in the mountains gave me strength after my personal loss. It was like being in a mountain monastery. I remarried a civil service officer who served as the chief secretary of Balochistan in Quetta, and I took up a job with another rural uh, development program, the Balochistan Rural Support Program, known as the BRSP, later becoming its chief executive officer. A woman as the CEO of the largest rural development organization in a male-dominated society of Balochistan was quite an undertaking. The program had become non-functional due to organizational and local politics. I was called upon to make it operational once again. I was able to successfully revive the dead institution, and today it is staffed by 1,000 professionals and conducts its development uh, operations in 13 districts of Balochistan, improving the quality of life of underprivileged rural men, women, and children. I continue to be on the board of directors. For the past 20 years, I have worked for improving the lives of the disadvantaged and underprivileged people of Pakistan, men, women, and children. My children stood by me all these years and gave me their unflinching support to lead a challenging, impossible, and dangerous life that I chose to lead. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, actually, Shahida, can you hear me? Is this working? Shahida and I were just talking about a project. I think she should work this material into a book and think I about do. publishing and be very So you'll help me with that. Yeah, I've got a publisher all lined up for you. Um, so, I, well, I think these two fragments of life stories um, challenge power, but they also challenge stereotypes and the sorts of narratives that we impose from us from the outside on other parts of the world, on Islam, on ethnic mi minorities, et cetera. And so I want, one thing I'd like to sort of throw out there, and then maybe we should bring the audience into this discussion. But um, I wondered if both of our speakers could share a little bit more with us um, of their lives. It seemed to me that um, Kishwar started her narrative when she hit the UK and went to grad school. <laughs> and I was wondering, since you said that um, politics is, is a very special animal and you have to be a very special animal in, in order to enter politics, but there's also that element of the contingent and the serendipity. What was it in your upbringing before you went to the UK in, in Pakistan that might have might have perhaps led you on this to this trajectory and not another <laughs> yes I, I i often reflect on that um this is a bare old moment well my father was an intelligence man wow. he was head of intelligence training uh in defense intelligence originally and then uh, overall and my mother had been educated at that great liberal institution the american university of beirut so she had come back to Pakistan, uh, quite a empowered feminist. She had four da daughters on whom to experiment. Um, and incidentally, Shahida, we went to the same school. We I hadn't did. realized. Uh, maybe we were classmates. Were you in huh? Murray or Karachi? Uh, uh, I was in Lahore. Lahore. I was in Lahore. Right. I, I went to Commons of Jesus and Mary in Murray. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah, she was at yeah, school yeah. when I was there. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, my, my mother came back and was a journalist to start with and then a television uh, producer. Um, I think the combination of, some, of a mother who lived in the Middle East and uh, wrote, was a writer in, in some form or the, or the other, and a father who was what we call a spook, essentially, uh, <laughs> led only in one direction, and that had to be intrigue, and there is nothing like political intrigue. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that was it. But you know, I mean, I have all my older siblings. One was the most senior Pakistani at the United Nations, uh, the other one is a professor at Northwestern University, a medic, medic professor. Um, and my brother was a businessman, my other sister is a manager. So we, we all went into completely different things. There was no pattern mm -hmm. in our family in terms of choices of professions. I, I believe that I've lucked out. I'm not sure they'd agree <laughs> with me. Uh, there, there's some disdain about politics in some aspects, particularly in the diplomats and senior civil right. servant level. You know, politics is dirty. And Shahid, I wonder if you could, um, I know you were at the Asian Development Bank for 18 years, and, but my husband, you're, oh, your husband, but, uh, um, but clearly you have decided, um, uh, devoted your energies and your life to girls' education and the transformative power of girls' education, which often is presented in this country as a, uh, being a threat, as being a menace, and we were talking earlier, and you said that actually this is not always the case. I mean, it's presented here, particularly in the states, that a girls, a girls institutions of learning, whether you know, um, a primary school or whatever, are often attacked. And so, I wonder if you could address that issue okay. a little bit for us. Yes, uh, why I read the whole the entire story here, which speaks out that uh, in Quetta which has been declared as the most dangerous city in the world, exists this women's university where the girls take driving lessons, they come to the university every day. So there is sort of, you know, I'm not, or they are not threatened in any way. Mm -hmm. My experience has been, because I worked also in the rural areas, up in the mm -hmm. northern areas, in Gilgit, uh, and in Balochistan, and elsewhere, working with the rural communities in the villages, in the Baloch areas, in the Pathan, Pashtun areas, wherever. Uh, the, uh, this rural development programs, they would, you know, that areas are dry, there's hardly any water. So we asked, we would sort of ask the communities during the community participation, social mobilization, your needs. And the first need would be provide them water, mm. whatever way. Once that is provided to them, the next demand was give us a school for our girls. Everywhere, in every village, in every part of Pakistan. Because the government schools would be at a distance, so they would want a school close by. And schools were set up, and there are different organizations setting up schools. That education is of different levels, again. There are these home schools, community schools that provide basic uh, education. There are these uh, government schools that are all over the country. There are these private schools, which, like the Convent of Jesus and Mary, and now the elite schools that provide English, English uh, instruction. Yes. There are institutions, educational institutions all over. There are girls' colleges, there are boys' colleges, there are universities. What is happening is in this, uh, the frontier area where action has been, military action has been taken against the, the local communities and schools have been blown up. So there is some political connection probably to that. <laughs> Otherwise, my experience is that I have not been, uh, mm -hmm. yes, we had a grenade thrown into the house of my uh, registrar just uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that lady herself is a Pashtun. We have tribes, she's a Pashtun and the people who threw the grenade in were speaking Pashto. Mm -hmm. So what was the reason? She has been an educationist for 35 years. She was the principal of the girls' college there. At one time in the girls' college, there are 6,000 students. And this is the university where I am. So this is a higher, you know, they come for the master's degrees. There are, you know, different gangs operating. Maybe these are the land grabbers. They probably threw the grenade in her home that she will sell her house at half the price mm -hmm. and move away. So these things are happening. My experience has been that 
everyone demands for schools, for their girls. Yeah. That's what, uh, what I uh, have been sort of seen. I haven't seen anywhere where they've said, OK, go away. We will not sort of uh, set up work with you. I alluded to the media a bit, but do you want to tell us that story of the major unnamed newspaper and their <laughs> special reporter who came to in report on the school? Or Well, what had I told you? What did I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> they won't be surprised, probably. <clears throat> uh, just as I mentioned, this uh, university uh, is... Uh, has become a visitor, visitor center, sort of, uh, a tourist attraction kind of thing. Because everyone, even in Pakistan, they think that Balochistan is close and very conservative. So anyone coming from the rest of Pakistan, they come to the women's university, they are amazed. Uh, the girls are confident, the girls are educated, the girls are you know, they'll talk to you, they'll talk to you in English. They may be sort of, when coming in, wearing the chadar or whatever. So that is the very, very, the best place for people to visit. Uh, one evening, I had guests come in around 6.30. So our universities, unlike the Western university, the universities here, everything shutdowns uh, at 2.30. The office timings are from 8.30 to about 2.30. And uh, then, and especially in Balochistan and the girls' institution, they all go away after 2.30. Uh, so nobody is there in the evening. So the entire campus is empty. But I have in the hostel 150 young women staying, doing their master's degree, senior, younger, junior, coming from all over Pakistan. So one evening, I had a guest, and with the guest, was another guest. So she was visiting. Ah, the person was visiting. And uh, was amazed, because this is a women's university, a foreigner. And I said, yes, and this is the fifth year going, and I have 2,000 students, and uh, you know, 700, you know, they've all got degrees, and you can come and see. Uh, I said, it's evening now. And we don't have anybody on campus except for the girls who are in the hostel. Uh, we just walked down there, and there was a large room because it was an old hospital building. So there was just the dining hall where I gathered all these young women. And I spoke to them, and I said, here is a visitor. And uh, you tell her, where have you all come from? So they were from all over Balochistan. They spoke excellent English. They were very confident. Some of them were married. Some had left their babies in their uh, hometowns. They were from all over, over Balochistan, the rural areas. And uh, she just asked a few questions. And then she asked me, where are the jihadis? <laughs> I said, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't see any. I've been here all these years, since 1994. And these girls, you asked them. Are the fathers jihadis? You asked them. You were there. So she said she, she, she was uh, amazed at whatever it was. She said she'll come in the morning, but got sort of unwell. She had a plane to catch and uh, did not. Uh, I wrote to her again, when are you coming? You're going to write about the women's university? That is the nice face of Pakistan. She never did. Maybe it was not an attractive story to write about. I told you not to ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I open it up to questions? Yeah. I think it's time now to, to bring the audience <clears throat> um, into this conversation more actively. So comments, questions, yes. Did everyone hear the question? I don't know if uh, everybody has been listening to uh, KQED, which is 
essentially my uh, uh, source of information uh, as of lately, uh, I've been in the car a fair bit. And uh, the uh, last thing I heard was that after all the problems in Swat, I think you people probably know about that, that the Sharia law had been passed there. Uh, Dr. Jaffrey, is this uh, the right news from Pakistan? Uh, Sharia law, it's been signed probably? Yes. yes. This, okay. this, was mm. the, this was what the... For, for Swat. For, for right. the Swat area. So that, they had, they had, that area has been conservative, so has been Balochistan. Swat, conservative as well as very modern, everyone went for their honeymoon to Swat. I know. Me, I mean, uh, I've too. been a great fan <laughs> yeah. of. Uh, Sharia. We have Sharia in Pakistan. You know, our inheritances and everything is according to the Sharia law. Uh, my question was how it's going to impact uh, education, Balochistan, uh, and education, specifically women's education okay. in Balochistan, because uh, as we hear, uh, schools were burnt down and worse things were done. Yeah. So, uh, Sharia law does not say that you burn down schools. No, yeah? definitely not. So, so that's what, but what does Islam say? Go to China to acquire education. It doesn't say the man goes to China to acquire education and the woman stays home. That's what sort of Islam says. Education is for men, women, for everyone. Sharia law does not prohibit education. For Balochistan, it has had, it will have it hasn't had any effect. But the university stays, the university, women's university in Peshawar. So these closing down of schools are some other elements. Islam doesn't say that. Thank you. Taliban who have taken over the administration of SWAT are destroying girls' schools. Mm -hmm. And if, if what you say that the villagers and the rural people, the second thing they demand after water is school for their girls, how will this situation reconcile itself? Will they rise against the Taliban? Uh, schools, about I think 200 or so schools have been blown up, burnt mm -hmm. in that area. Yes, school. Uh, there are schools uh, in, in uh, the rural areas which are co-educational. Girls and boys all go into the same school. It's very interesting. The little ones go together, and then at the university, the men and women go together. In between, you have separate institutions. Huh? Frontier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in everywhere. Frontier. In Balochistan, in the frontier. My experience that I will speak of about Balochistan, they continue to demand the same schools. The Taliban, the, those kind of Taliban haven't come here yet. So, I haven't experienced that. Because uh, all these programs, the development programs that we work with, the community programs, based programs, schools are continuing, continuing to be, they continue, they're continuing. Well, I think this challenges us to chart power, doesn't it? Uh, if in one province of, of Pakistan um, they could pass a Sharia law or impose legislation purporting to be Sharia, of course it's never monolithic and it depends on how you interpret it, as is true of all legal systems. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, I think it, it goes the, I think the effect of it goes beyond this tribal areas. There's no doubt in my mind that there is a chilling effect across the whole country. Um, and I have friends in the cities who are now talking about, particularly people who work for NGO and civil society organizations, human rights organizations, who are now talking about faxes, death threats, very difficult times. And I, I think there's no, you know, at the moment as we sit here, 
you may not feel the effect, but over time, if you have an a la carte menu of governance, I mean, I would say that, that, that federalism, wonderful though it is, in an American audience, I couldn't possibly say anything else, but uh, federalism, wonderful though it is, I think federalism works best in slightly more developed societies. Societies have to go through the nation building, the getting together part of nation building before they can, the autonomy part can come in. And I think one of the problems with this particular move, this a la carte menu, this particular region voted overwhelmingly only last year for secular parties. So I think if you were to allow the ballot box to determine whether they have Sharia law or not, the answer is not very old, and the answer was definitively no. It's thugs and the power of the gun that has brought this law about. And it will have an impact over the rest of the country. Perhaps not today, but in, over time. Would anyone, would you, would you mind going to the microphones at the, in the aisles? Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that both uh, women are powerful. We're talking about power here today, both of our uh, representatives here. Um, and yet, they both have the similarity in that they're products of something other than the, the, the cultural milieu which you're talking about in Pakistan. I mean, you both went to presumably sort of Catholic schools or something, and, and you both and spent a lot of time outside of Pakistan, and, and you've both become very powerful. Do you think that if you were a product, particularly to you, Professor Jaffrey, do you think if you were a product of um, the school that you're now at, the opportunities that are being provided there would have allowed you to be as successful in Pakistan. I mean, is there something in Pakistan that sort of uh, gives more opportunity to women that have been outside the country? Or do you think it's just the confidence that you both have naturally and it's got nothing to do with the sort of foreign aspect of the upbringing? It's just interesting to me. This was addressed to you, I think. <laughs> uh, we were all sent to the convent of Jesus and Mary's. Huh? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when we were little, they were the good schools, they were the private schools, uh, yes. But uh, my entire education was in Pakistan. I did my PhD when I was uh, abroad. Yes, we stayed 18 years outside Pakistan. That has in impacted my personality. Uh, yes and no, because uh, you will find within Pakistan as uh, this, the leadership kind of qualities in women, even, even early on when Pakistan was created, the women who were the leaders in politics, they were from within, within the, the area. And they, they had power, they gained it, they earned it, they studied within Pakistan, within the country. We had last, uh, was Zubaida Jalal, was a minister for education. She comes from a very remote part of uh, Balochistan in Makran, where there were no roads. Huh? She was the minister for education for so many years, for almost 10 years. Yes, I have an advantage, but at the same time, you will find women in every field, in every sphere. The women studying at the university will have the same opportunities. They'll come into politics. In the Balochistan uh, uh, Provincial Assembly, you have women. 33% are elected, uh, have to be elected. That's what the law now says in, in, the parlim in, in, a parlim in different houses. Even if they are not elected, they're special seats. So they, you have ministers, or women ministers in our, uh, uh, the provincial assemblies and all the four provincial assemblies. One of my students, uh, she's done her two masters and she was contacted by people because they are reserved seats to become a member of the assembly and later she could become a minister. So they have opportunities. Yeah. We have a sort of a different kind of uh, because I happen to live abroad, and that kind of maybe influence on me, but you will find very confident, educated, 
Pakistani, Pakistani women who studied. No, you have very good education in some of the very good institutions in Pakistan. Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, there is there is a great demand, great demand for women to be employed, qualified. They should uh, they should have the relevant skills. For instance, the United Nations organizations have been coming to the women's university because under their their recruitment rules, they have to be. 50% have to be, you know, the gender balance, women, 50% men. And uh, they came that they will recruit here. The skills, you know, the writing skills, the experiences, you have very, very bright women in Pakistan, the Pakistani educated women. Uh, we have very good uh, uh, educational institutions in Pakistan. You had the Kanet College, you had uh, the Lahore College for Women, you have LUMS, they're old institutions. Yes, uh, the universities. I wanted to add I'm that Shahida was, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Sorry. She was considered an outsider, by the way, in, in Baluchistan. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to think about different sorts of insides yeah. and outsides. Maybe, please go ahead. I must say, I have, a, I have a slightly different perspective of it. I think there are two, three different things implicit in your question. Uh, we are, I think it's fair to say, we're both products of the elite establishment. These are elite schools you're talking about. Kinnad College, where my older sister went, uh, these are not the institutions that ordinary Pakistani women have access to, first of all. Um, so, you know, the, I don't think, certainly for myself, it's not exceptionalism that puts me here. I, I mean, speaking for where I have carved out my career, which is in the West, you see second and third generation daughters of very humble origin migrants who are doing terribly well. So it isn't a factor of being the elite. That, that I think it's just those younger women than me are just lucky to be living in the West at a time when, in general, women's equality has made significant advances. But I think there is something about women in Pakistan is that the, the narrative of these women ministers and and leaders is actually a very narrow stream of people with very similar backstories. And I would argue, I mean, certainly at the time I was growing up, and I see it now among my contemporaries' children, everybody's desperate to get their children educated abroad. Nobody's saying among our contemporaries, the people that we would know, that, oh, I really think that the local university, Karachi University, is going to produce the medical degree. Dow Medical College is going to produce the medical degree for my, my daughter or son. Uh, they are keen to send their children abroad because uh, credentials, the credential of having been abroad, I mean, I despair because I'm chancellor of a university in, in the UK, which gets a high number of Pakistani students. And I think there's something else, is that the mainstream experience of women in Pakistan is still one where they work in the more traditional, softer professions. Yeah. I mean, you don't see vast amounts of them in, for example, science, in well, certainly not at senior positions in the military, certainly not at senior positions in, in the traditional male areas, senior banking, senior governance, and so on, boards, on the boards of companies. You, you don't see very many. You see the same faces going around who are all uh, the gender. They may by gender be women, but frankly, it's got more to do with the family name than the experience. But, you know, I look at it from a distance, so you might be more skeptical of what I'm saying than Shaiva, who's, of course, there on the ground. Well, just think about American parents. We just bankrupted ourselves by educating our child in this country instead of sending her <laughs> overseas. So, I mean, so, you know, we have to think about these, <laughs> these ironies and contradictions in the international education market. And yes, okay. Could you take the um, microphone right by you? Oh, or there's, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I would like to thank you for this uh, extraordinary opportunity that the Abbasid program gave us uh, to listen to this wonderful experience um, uh, from um, 
of, uh, of uh, women in Muslim women, I would never heard, heard about you without coming here. And I think that what we should do is challenge the power of information. What I've heard about by being here is on the first uh, page of very well-known journal in French one about the school of SOA and SWAT, SWAT sorry, with the video record, you know, etc. But about your school, <laughs> nobody mentioned this anyway. Mm -hmm. And also about your experience, because, you know, when something happened to Herald Tribune, for example, last year, on the first page titled about this woman, you know, who has been divorced by her husband in the Algerian, you know, case, first page, Mo um, one Muslim woman was divorced, and it was, of course, generalization of all for everywhere. So, what I think we, we is important is how we can change the representation. Mm -hmm. And even here, we, can, we we still think that it is cannot happen to women only if they go abroad or you know. So, and this is the power of information. And um, for me, it is uh, very very important. Thank you. Well, that's an old, I mean, thinking historically back to the colonial period, which I do, British and French colonialism, uh, saving their women, that, this, that idea has been around for a while, that we have to, the British and the, in South Asia said, we, we have to save the Indian woman from the Indian man who missed it. So we're still, that narrative still keeps going on and we have to ask why is it being replicated and reproduced uh, for so long? Um, I don't have any answers, but anyway, we can think about it. Yes, go ahead, please. As, a, as people who don't live in America, and you know, you've talked about CNN, um, what do you think the American media and the American people aren't getting about you know, women in Pakistan or education in Pakistan? And also, like you know, you always hear about people uncovering terror plots in Birmingham, but you don't really hear about the people being released. So just stuff like that. I mean, what do you think we need to know, and how do you think it can be better? Pe how people can find out? How can the media? Report it better. Yeah. Students. Um, uh, well, I think you know the the. I think terrorism has a, a grip on the popular imagination mm. that is way disproportionate to the actual incidence or threat of it, and it's. I mean, it seems to me, looking at my country whenever I'm abroad, that all we seem to hear about Britain any longer is terrorism. Or, or banks going bust. I mean, there doesn't seem to be very much in the middle. Um, it, I think one of the problems, in the, which is peculiar to the UK, and you don't really have that at the same level at all here, is that our terrorists are Britons. They're homegrown. I mean, this last spate of the dozen who were arrested uh, last week, they were extremely unusual that 11 were from Pakistan. They were Pakistani students and only one but generally they tend to be people who are British nationals. And that evokes something in the media, something in, in the psyche naturally, because you then do become more suspicious of your neighbor and everything else. That evokes something that is very easy for the media to capture. Going with a film crew to a small town in West Yorkshire and speaking to people uh, about whether the chip shop owner's son, uh, who played jolly good cricket, by the way, but. Did he ever say that he was going to blow up people on the London Underground? You know, as if he would have been dumb enough to say that down the cricket, cricket green. Um, so so it's, it's an easy story. It's an easy story to spin. It's lazy journalism. And you're quite right that the stories of the releases are, are never reported. But there is something about public policy, and I lay the blame quite squarely, I'm afraid, on the government. And I'm not saying this as an opposition pol politician. I was part of Prime Minister Blair's task force on Muslim extremism. Um, I think there's things about which one sh simply has to be nonpartisan, and I feel that in this I'm proud to be nonpartisan. But it is something about public policy. When you keep telling people the terror threat is so high, that we're in a level, we've been in a level of severe threat now for four years in the UK. You know, it's a bit hard to wake up every morning and look at your threat level and see it's red and still worry about whether you should check your car or not. I mean, this is when you have a government that, in order to get through its pretty unpleasant laws, is trying to keep people frightened, if you have the politics of fear, then it's a home game for the media. I mean, you know, they don't have to go to the movies to invent the story. They can get it straight from, you know, the Home Office, or Ministry of the Interior. Um, so I think there is something about 
sloppiness, but also about a public atmosphere that creates that negativity. But I think the negativity about the Sharia or the perceptions of women or, you know, floggings in Nigeria and Kaduna province in Nigeria and all of those are a new product because actually floggings in Kaduna province have been happening from when I first went to Nigeria in the 70s. And there's nothing new. I think what is new is the interest of the world in the clash of civilizations theory. So, so there is more interest or in, oh, look at how horrible they are and look how ba badly they treat their women and look how they exploit human rights. And if, you, if, you're, if you're setting out from that frame, it's easy enough to find, you know, how many people set out with the frame of, oh, look how badly this part of, and look how much domestic violence this part of New York has. And how many times do you see an inside story in the New York Times doing that, the levels of domestic violence? It's, it's just, uh, it goes back and forth because we have an interest in it. The media reflects our purity. Did you want to add anything to that, Shahida? Well, I think I'll uh, pass. Go ahead. <coughs> okay, well, I have a question uh, that perhaps both of you could address from your different perspectives. You, you mentioned early in your presentation this idea of doubt, like that perhaps, you know, you doubt if you've got to your position because you're a woman or, or on merit, and I wonder, um, when you think about that for yourself or you, you know, speak to your colleagues about it, whether you think it's something in your own psyche or whether you see other people treating you differently based out of that doubt, um, and to what degree it's both. And then from your perspective, I wonder if you know, you've created a school just for women, um, if you thought about that or if you see that playing out in perhaps the women's relationships with their husbands or you know, this idea that now they have access to a university that perhaps others in the locality might not um, because they're men. And I say that not because I'm a man and think women in Pakistan are overly privileged, of course, but I wonder if you see it playing out in the, relation, the gender relationships in the area and uh, how, how you think about it in your life. Well, self-doubt. I think actually self-doubt is deeply noble. I think all people should doubt themselves, and politicians more than the norm, uh, because we do stuff that affects people's lives. So, yes, I think self-doubt, re re reflective being has to, has to be uncertain. You can't be a reflective being if you're not. But I think when you are, when you've started life early on, I mean, long before I got to, to be a public figure in politics, even when I was just writing policy, I found myself constantly the first. You know, I was the first director for a major political party who was non-white. I was the first uh, person who worked in the European Parliament uh, from representing 15, 20 different countries who was non-white at that level and so on. So when you're constantly an outlier or is outlier the right expression? Anyway, when you're constantly the one and, and there aren't others against which to test yourself, two things happen. One can be that you think, you start believing the, the nonsense that you really are good. You start believing that you're special and everybody else from your community isn't special. Or you realize I, that actually there are an awful lot of talented people who make it to those levels and that you're quite privileged and you try and learn from those experiences. Of course, it's much more difficult because the lexicon, the language, the, the modus operandi, when you come into a new culture, those, there are all these implicit codes that you have to learn because they're not evident, they're not there for you. You, didn't, you, you weren't imbued in them, you didn't grow up in them and you have to learn them. And so you, know, you, make, you stumble, you fall, you pick yourself up and you go on again. It's hard to say where you lie as a person. I think it's for others to judge. Can I have the question, uh, what, we, what, what did you ask? Sure, I'm wondering if you see the women in the school you run like thinking of themselves as particularly privileged because they're women, or if you see men in the community viewing them as particularly privileged because they are women, or if this idea of um, 
displacing their merit and placing it some, on some other trait that has given them the privilege of going to university um, plays out at all in the community. Hmm. Does that make sense? I feel like that was rather convoluted. Are, are you suggesting, maybe you're uh, arguing that in certain parts, not only of Pakistan, but actually everywhere in the globe, that education is a scarce resource to be struggled over and maybe that can explain some of the antipathy towards girls' education over, and maybe the thought being that it's neglecting boys' education, is that? Well, sort of, just to the extent that in the area it would be a, it would be a scarce resource. And it's sort of, you know, I believe, I totally agree that women, uh, particularly in past Pakistan, likely need education targeting them, but I wonder to what extent that targeting comes out as like an affirmative action. Like in America, we have this big backlash that, oh, now you're privileged because of your class or some other thing um, that wasn't merit-based. I wonder if you see people doubting graduates from university, for example, because they went there because they were women, or does that you know, not resonate? Hmm. I still, I still did not understand. Anyway, uh, the men have the equal opportunity to go attend a university. Women stayed back because they did not go into a co-educational university. So they were the sufferers or sort of staying back. The women's university has been created to provide an opportunity for the, all the girls or women who for some reason were not allowed by the society or the families to attend a co-educational institution. So they were, you know, we have in Pakistan the universities where men and women study together. And a large uh, segment of uh, the women or the girls are not sent for higher education because they are co-educational. So they are the sufferers. Creation of the women's university is providing the women the opportunity which was not available to them earlier on. So the, the boys have the opportunity to go to any university. So they get their empowerment or whatever. So the girls who were staying back with the creation of the university is providing them an opportunity to acquire education and skills and sort of do whatever they want to. So it is not sort of, uh, you know, that the women will consider themselves superior in some way because they are educated and the men are sort of staying behind or whatever. So the men already had the opportunities. It was the women who were lacking that those opportunities which have been created by the government now. Here in the US, you have uh, women's universities, several of them very, very old ones, huh? and now you have, you know, the, the mixed institutions too. So Pakistan just created for the past 10 years new universities for women only. I don't know whether it answers your question. Not as yet, huh? Okay. I have sort of a general, I mean, from the West, there is a perception that women's rights in Islamic countries and in Pakistan are um, being abused and that they aren't seen as equal citizens. And Pakistan's interesting because there's a good dichotomy where we do not, everybody's heard of Benazar Bhutto or they've heard of Asma Jahangir and very strong um, women, but then you, there's also a 60% or 70% illiteracy rate and two out of every three women in Pakistan can't read. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many women there who don't even know they have a right to meet, let alone be educated, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so even though there seems to be some movement in some regions to encourage um, community uh, government roles, things like that, um, it still seems very slow and, um, and also a lot of other forces that, like the Taliban that are moving against women's rights. So um, how is there, I mean, what is your prognosis for the future? Is there going to be change? Is it going to be, is there a way to speed it up? Is there, and I guess the other question related to that is that, for example, there is domestic abuse in this country, but the laws don't allow it, whereas in Pakistan, for example, the laws do allow it, yeah. and they do encourage it, which makes it a much more difficult situation. And I wonder, you know, where, how you go about changing that. Do we just have to wait till everybody gets educated? It's going to be a long wait. So, I guess any comment? You want to answer that? Well, I, I would say this. I mean, I don't know if you were talking about domestic abuse in Pakistan, but the law doesn't allow it. Well, so, so I mean, if you're talking about the imposition of Sharia in in these certain parts, yes. Now I see. There is acceptance 
of a certain, a certain form of abuse against women. Yeah, actually, that's th that's actually changed. I have to say, I took I took some part in bringing about that change, okay. but we have now got legislation in the UK, uh, making it offen an offence to forcibly marry your daughter, um, directed quite specifically at certain communities. So, and therefore, there's huge now consular assistance. I mean, poor young British officers <laughs> travel to remote regions because they got a text message from somebody saying, "I'm in danger. Come and help me." And you know, there, there's, it's the, the challenge of being a diplomat in Pakistan now, if you're British, is very different to what it used to be. Uh, but I think there is, I'll address a general point very briefly. I know we're running out of time. There is no doubt an absence of, e of equality in Muslim countries for women. There is no doubt about that. You're absolutely right. And of course, you know, Pakistan seems to make it into the headlines because. Saudi Arabia, which is the most egregious offender in that regard, is considered a friend of the United States because you need the gas. <laughs> so nobody points the finger there yeah, at the true. egregious violations of women's rights. And um, the Gulf countries and Iran and Egypt, and you know, you can I can go on. The 54, 57 countries in the Organization of Islamic Conference, every single one of them, I, I don't think there's one that could lift its head up and say women here have real equality. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> maybe. Okay, but so, so yes, and, and you know, what are we going to do about it? You can't change culture that readily, particularly where in the West we're saying, you know, you need to make the choices of who you elect, and you need to make your own decisions about who you want to govern you, and then say, but we'll write for you what your constitution has to say. So yeah, go ahead and go ahead and make, as we're trying to say in Afghanistan this week, but go ahead and have your democratic elections, but you better not bring in these laws, by the way, if you have democratic elections. And we've got to be, we've got to wake up to what we really want in our engagement from the Muslim world. And we, uh, we have not yet discovered what we want. And we need to discover that and then be consistent in the application of our policy in the West towards those countries. And we're failing abysmally because we're sending mixed signals all over the place. You know, ignore the ones where you need them, where they are strategic and globally of interest to you, and come down like a ton, as Richard Armitage said in the famous quote, we'll bomb you back to the Stone Age <laughs> if you don't conform <laughs> to the war on terror. We're as much at fault, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Not as much, but we're at fault as well. We need to self-reflect on that one. Well, uh, Professor Gregg is telling me that our time is well, I unfortunately. Think we'll do it again, but if people want to comment, yeah. yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.